right, folks, we are pumped up. This is, you know, we, we finally got a little juice in the building on a Monday here, boys. I feel like, you know, we start the show, we're a little, uh, you know, we, got, we need the wind in our sails. We finally got an incredible guest, and we were pumped here Monday, uh, March 8th. Welcome, everyone, to Living Room Sports Talk. We've got Kira McCauley, Chad Catcherbone, Zach Rothenberger. We're great. John Janini is joining us here in the studio. That's it. That's it. Also, we got the round of applause here, boys. Let's go. It's pumping up. Coach, thank you so much for jumping on with us. Well, I've been here. I love talking sports, and uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to meet you guys. And I love the LaSalle Sweet 16 banners. Of, of course, that makes me feel very welcome immediately. <laughs> of course. And then if, if there's any a time, ever a time to bring this out, tonight is the night. So had to get it, and, had to get it rolling. Uh, an Explore alum, me and you, graced the halls of Go Arena together, a former baseball player. And I, I love the gear in addition to the banner, man. We'll, we'll hang yeah. out with a couple of state and temple guys. Uh, I'm, we'll come with them. I'm <laughs> sure you remember. I'm sure you remember real well that we probably practiced together on that court. Many oh. times in the winter. <laughs> the, the practice facility was everyone's practice facility. You're right. We, we, we all worked together and we made it work. Yep. Oh, I love it. And, and for, for anyone that doesn't, that might not be in our Philadelphia market. So Dr. John Giannini was, uh, well, you got an amazing record. It's funny. I'm thinking, like, where do I start with your resume, coach? Um, incredible teacher, coach. Uh, you know, he started all the way back. From the, it's funny. We were talking before we jumped on the air about how a Chicago native probably was not the best idea for me to wear my Packers attire. I was just trying to find the sound colors tonight. But but all the way up until right you from Chicago all the way working your way into the Philadelphia circuits and, and all the success you've had um, up until that point. So we're so excited to have you on, and we really appreciate you making time. Oh, um, it's an honor. Well, perfect. So to, to that point, I'll, I'll, these guys will laugh. I feel like when we do these interviews, I always ask the cliche question, <laughs> kind of get the ball rolling. But – Normally, I'm going to, before I go, what, what was it like to be a coach? That's I'll go a little bit better than that. I'll do, you know, you start as, as a kid in Chicago, right? And and you work, uh, you get you become a doctor, right? You go through your GA for, for Illinois. You become a head coach at Rowan to Maine to, you know, the Philadelphia area. So I guess just, you know, a lot of this obviously has to do with the classroom and basketball or the common denominator. So I guess the game of basketball and just education in general, how much did that play a role just in your success to this point and just your, uh, your giant, incredible resume? Well, I, I liked it. So you don't have to go to college to be a great success. And I, I know people have done amazing things and never set foot on a college campus, um, some family members. Uh, but for me, college changed my life. And I like to say that I had so much fun, I never left. Uh, and from the day I moved into my dorm in 1980 till now, I've never worked anywhere other than a college campus. Um, so my senior year, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was a Division three basketball player. I was a good player, but, you know, certainly never going to be a professional player. And uh, I was a psychology major, and I became aware of the field of sports psychologists. And I said, oh, my God, this is my love for sport. Um, I, I like psychology. So at that point, I, I wanted to be the best sports psychologist ever and help athletes. And uh, it's, it's an amazing story. I cold called the coach North Texas only because I wasn't ready to give basketball up. I knew I was going to grad school, but I couldn't imagine not being around basketball. Little did I know that Division One coaches get, without exaggeration, hundreds of emails and letters a year saying, my dream is to be a college coach. I'll volunteer. I'll sleep on the floor. I'll do anything. Please give me a chance. Let me work with your program. I mean, hundreds. Um, and you usually hire people that are former players and that you know. So to cold call a Division One coach and think you're going to get a job is beyond naive. And it's like winning the lottery. And I cold called the coach from North Texas, Division One head coach. I'm calling from Chicago, a 21 year old Division Three player. He said, oh, my gosh, I just had a GA get another job, and I'm going to be in Chicago tomorrow on a stopover, on a flight connection if you want to get together. This was obviously three, 25, 30 years before 9-11. So used to just be able to go up to a gate and meet someone. But we met, and I got into coaching that way uh, only because I wasn't ready to give up basketball. And then I had to make a choice between academics, uh, going on being a professor somewhere, or coaching. And like you guys, just the adrenaline of sports. As much as I love education, you, you, there's nothing like the feeling that you get um, 
from winning a big game or being with your teammates and those relationships. You just can't get that feeling, I think, in like any other job. So, uh, yeah, I went into coaching and I had a good run. Hmm. It's funny you mentioned that competitive spirit. I, I guess did any of that come from having was it three other brothers growing up in Chicago in the suburbs and everything, being the oldest? It, not really. I, I just found out when I was young that I was pretty good at sports, and I fell in love with it. I I loved going to the Cubs, Bears, Blackhawks, uh, Bulls games. Uh, I couldn't get enough of it, and uh, I was just like you guys. I just uh, fell in love with sports and. And realize that as an athlete, the best lesson I learned as a young athlete is the harder you work, the better you do, which applies to almost anything. And then when I got older, and especially as a coach, what it really teaches you is how to handle adversity because you uh, you lose and you have disappointment and you got to pull yourself back up. So it, it's true that sport really does teach you some great lessons. So, so I got to ask kind of an off off the wall question here. You keep talking about Chicago, and I know you buy some time. So, what pizza is better? Is it Chicago? Is it is it the New York Philly style? What is it? Pizza here is not very good, and I'll tell you why. It is greasy. It like, <laughs> it's soggy. You guys just don't know any better. So, go to Chicago <laughs> and there you hold it up, and it doesn't fall onto the floor. Like it's crispy. <laughs> It's delicious. The tomato sauce is better. Uh, and then, you know, the thick crust is a totally different level. Um, so, yeah, you guys, I hate to tell you, you just don't know any better. <laughs> well, well, I, now, I, now, is it Lou well, Malnati's or Jared Allen's? Like slice, we should know better, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, I got to show my my geography skills. So, I have had Lou Malnati's before. Now, is that better than Giordano's or that's the okay, next one on my yeah. list? Say so I've again. had Lou Malnati's before in Chicago. Oh, yeah. is, is that is that better or worse than Giordano's? Level. It's a little bit different. It's like comparing uh, Mahomes and Brady. They're both great. <laughs> I love that. See, I'm going to do that next time we go to Chicago. We'll do the comparison for them. We'll talk. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> we actually have somebody in our chat. So, uh, Dr. John, we, we have a chat on here through Facebook. Um, so one of our viewers is asking, when you are relax relaxing, what is your favorite sport to watch and uh, play in your leisure? I love to fish, and I'm serious about it. I actually go in the Midwest up in northern Wisconsin. I musky fish, and uh, like you know how some people are totally serious about golf, spend a trillion dollars on it, and take lessons. I'm like that about that kind of fishing. Uh, never got into the salt water because I grew up in the Midwest and there's no oceans there. But I actually go back to the North Woods. And when I coached at Maine, I lived on a lake. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, no. Here's, here's where I go in August. Oh, my wow. God. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just gorgeous. It's, there's no people. It's me and the animals. And, uh, you know, I, it's great. I love it. But thank you for asking that question. Yeah. Yeah, I forgot. I actually know. I digress. I know Chicago Bears football, college basketball, and uh, Midwest fishing. Not so much freshwater fishing. I, I could talk pretty much. Not a great fly fisherman. I dabble in it, but uh, I could talk most kind of fishing. So there's actually three things I could talk about. Wow. <laughs> well, it's funny. Of course, yeah, we're, we're talking about – this was – guys, this was a horrible job I had wearing the Packers stuff. I'm, like, actually ashamed. <laughs> but, but this is another Midwest thing. People are nicer in the Midwest because you won't believe this. The Packers are my second favorite team. Like, you would never hear an Eagles fan say, well, the Cowboys are my second favorite team. But I grew up <laughs> watching all the games. I like their uniforms. I like their team. And legitimately, if, if – uh, they're not playing the Bears, or it doesn't have playoff in implications for the Bears. I, I like the Packers, which that just shows you how nice we are in the Midwest. Uh, it's so true out in the Midwest. I always call it like the grocery stores to me the biggest way of determining it. I mean, Zach and I went to Wisconsin together, so we can <laughs> test. I mean, you see how like, you go to the grocery store, I feel like in, in southeastern Pennsylvania, everyone just kind of looks at you. We're at the Midwest, like, hi, how's it going? You know, and they're like oh, bagging yeah. the groceries. There's yeah, absolutely. <laughs> 
Um, but I'll tell you, let me ask you. So, you know, you start speaking of the Midwest. So, obviously, so I guess you were a GA at Illinois when you guys went to the Final Four. I think it was it was in nineteen eighty nine, I believe. Yeah. So yeah. How much did that influence? It's funny because I was looking. I was like, wow, you've been you were in the dance like well before you know the LaSalle days and everything in the D one level. And I mean, how much did that help you just even go into like your first job as a D three coach at Rowan? Oh. I mean, it's like uh, you know you want to be a cook and you're uh, uh, a busboy at a five-star restaurant, you know? And that's what GAs do. They do busboy type stuff, rebound for people in drills and help run summer camp and make sure guys are going to class. And once in a while, they ask you for your opinion, but it's just you're soaking everything in. And to be, uh, uh, and I did, a, as you said, North Texas for the first two years, Illinois for the next three years. And, you know, to go from D3 to D1 and then to go to the very top of D1, it was just an incredible education. That's all I could say. I mean, uh, I was there and saw the best players and the best coaches, and, and I didn't have to wonder what it was like in the big time and what the players were like and what the coaching was like and what the atmosphere was like. I got to see that at such a young age. And in all honesty, if I would have stayed – the coach at Rowan or a place like that, it would have been okay with me because I knew what it was like in the big. And in all honesty, the kids at Westchester and the kids at Rowan and the kids at Widener and the kids at Muhlenberg and uh, um, they, to them, like a Rowan Stockton game is no different than Illinois, Michigan to those kids. It's just as important. And it's just as loud. It's just that there's a thousand people in a thousand seat gym instead of sixty thousand in a fifteen thousand seat place. Um, but yeah, it, it, it was phenomenal. And you'd be surprised that besides the talent of the players and the media and fan attention, the actual coaching is the same. You still got to make sure kids are on time and responsible and good people and good students and they play unselfish and they play smart, they play hard and the fundamentals of the game are the same. And, uh, you know, so you find out that uh, it really isn't as different as you think. And so let me jump in the chat real quick. So we have a couple questions. Um, so this is a great one. So they were asking, what would, what is from Joe P they were saying, what, uh, what would it be like coaching right now, Dr. Giannini, in a, in a time like this with COVID and, and just oh. the pandemic? And I mean, and you know, as an AD right so, now at Rowan, I mean, it's probably, I can't imagine what your life's like right now. So the, the thing that I do that I really love besides working at Rowan, which is a great school, is I, I'm doing broadcasting. I did uh, ESPN LaSalle and uh, GW Fordham last week, and then I went and did Conference USA games. I did uh, Marshall and Charlotte over the weekend. I'm going to go do uh, Western Kentucky and Louisiana Tech in the Conference USA tournament this week. So oh, I'm awesome. A, yeah, so I'm around coaches constantly and talking to them and preparing. And the games are great, but in all honesty, they're not having a good experience. Uh, the kids, most of them haven't, so a lot of them haven't seen family since uh, – uh, since the summer, they, a lot of them weren't allowed to go home for Christmas. They literally, because of remote classes and, and they're tested every day, they just go from practice to their dorm rooms. They live in constant anxiety of whether or not they're going to test positive and they're scared to go out and be around anyone. And of course, countless games are canceled constantly. At the For example, Conference USA Tournament, they just had a forfeit in the first round. I think Florida Atlantic tested positive and whoever they're playing is getting a bye and moving on. And, um, you know, so they're not having a good experience. They don't, they, like you go back to football season, Clemson gets on the plane, they land at Florida state and they tell them, go back. We got a positive test. Like you work all week for these games and then they don't happen. Or you wake up and you're shut down for two weeks. You're looking for Villanova. I mean, they went a month without playing. Temple went up. St. Joe's, too. St. Joe's, Temple, Villanova all had shutdowns for like a month. It's not good. It's not fun. So they're doing it because they love to play. Uh, but I, I really think when they look back on it, I'm not sure they're going to say it was really worth it. Sorry to be a downer on that. But <laughs> no, I love that. That's a real no, take. It's yeah, an honest, but, it's on a, honest answer. That's what we're looking but for. You got to appreciate what these kids and coaches are doing. 
They are mm -hmm. literally not having a social life. They constantly have anxiety. They constantly have disappointment. And uh, it's really very difficult playing college sports during COVID. And, and let me add to it, because it, and it's fine. I want to ask the personal question, because when you were bringing up your broadcasting, we were watching the St. Joe's LaSalle game that you were on the call for, and you made a point. There was a lot of things I loved that you're broadcasting, failing to extend the game. when Because I think it was LaSalle and St. Joe's were going back and forth. It was pretty close. And you were talking about, I think it was around like 45, 55 seconds, how you would think about fouling just to extend that clock. And I saw Bill Self do it about, I think it was maybe like two or three years ago. Um, I think Kansas was playing West Virginia and they were down by like 11, 12. And they just took this ridiculous route to just start fouling with like two and a half minutes left. And it just, they just kept working their way back in. The team would split a pair of free throws. They'd come back, play some soft defense, not to go a basket. And I, and I remember thinking like, this is genius. Like, and I, you, you know, I, I guess actually, I'm just going to ask the question as, but, I, as I ran for uh, the coach. Uh, 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 incredible example. Of it is from before you guys were born, 1988, Illinois, Villanova, in the NCAA tournaments, in the second round. We're up by 11 with about two and a half minutes left. And Raleigh Massimino starts following us, and we start missing free throws, and they start making threes, and we end up losing the game. So a lot of it depends. You're not going to win if you're down late and the other team doesn't turn it over and makes free throws. If the other team turns it over, that you really got a great chance. Or if the other team can't make free throws, you really got a chance. That Illinois team was freakishly athletic. I mean, as athletic as any college basketball team in history. But we weren't a great shooting team. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that, that lesson is a tried and true one. Um, you either got to turn them over or make them miss free throws. But if you're down and you can't steal the ball, foul, make the game go a little longer. Sometimes even good free throw shooting teams get tight late in the game. Yeah. No, and I, I actually was so excited to hear your voice to, to start that game. I, I thought we were going to win. Um, uh, but, I actually, but let's. I, I, I'm disappointed because I'm one and one now because. The first LaSalle game I did this year was LaSalle-Richmond, which was a huge upset. But mm -hmm. the only game that I'm torn on, and it sounds bizarre because there's no one I wanted to beat more than St. Joe's. Even my kids said, <laughs> I like all the Philly schools when they were talking about going to college, but they said, but we'll never go to St. Joe's. So, <laughs> it's not, But Billy Lane, the St. Joe's play, coach, played for me at Rowan, and I loved him. Okay. So, no yeah. kidding. Yeah. So that game to me now, I just love both coaches. Yeah, no, that was, and you were right down the middle for the broadcast too. You did an excellent job. <laughs> you could barely <laughs> tell that you're the, the yeah, ex coach. I, yeah, I, I, number one, I want to be good at the broadcasting. And number two, uh, I coached with Ash, Ashley Howard, mm -hmm. who was on my first staff at, but then I staffed together for a year or two at Bowen Oak. So right. it's, it's all love, man. It really That's is. So we, we, we try to beat the snot out of each other, but afterwards, like, you got a lot of friendships. It's just like me and Dump or me and Phil Martelli. And Jay, like, Philly is great that way. I almost think, so you compare it to the Midwest and the Big Ten. Mm -hmm. A lot of those coaches hate each other in the Midwest because they're recruiting, because they recruit against each other, and they're constantly trying to get the edge. In Philly, not only is it a tradition that's been handed down for decades that we're going to get along and be classy, but you really can't negative recruit or cheat in Philadelphia because everyone's just a few miles away. Like if you try to do something, everyone would know about it. Whereas if you're coaching, <laughs> you know, uh, three or four states removed, I won't name states where people might be doing funny business. But you try to get away with it. But when you're just down the street from Temple and St. Joe's, you're really – so they're really clean programs. They're really good people coaching. But from Coach Cheney to, um, to uh, all the people that – from Rowley to Speedy Morris, like those guys, for, they always just respected each other. And, and that's still true. So this is like a perfect transition then. So I was going to ask about the, the 2013 run and just more so how how did that feel or how special was that for the LaSalle community? And then kind of just explain 
like the entire city gets behind every big five team that goes on a run in the tournament. But how that felt as, as the head coach of the team, um, that every single person in the city was supporting you through it. So uh, I'll tell you uh, the coaching side of it and then the realization side of it. And I learned this. You guys asked about Illinois. We're in the final four. We're in the, we played in uh, the, the Dome in Indiana and then out in Seattle. I mean, we're playing in front of 50,000 on the biggest stage. And everything was the same as a regular season game. Like, we didn't break any of our routines. We practiced the same, ate the same, ate the same schedules. We didn't get more hyped. Uh, like, we were in a routine. And that's how you win a big game. If you start treating it different, well, now you're breaking your routine and maybe putting too much emphasis on it which mentally just makes you press so same thing with me and the sweet 16 team like we were business as usual but at the final four if you guys can ever go to a final four you got to do it it is a blast socially there's parties all over the town is exploding and everywhere you go people are happy and having fun you see school spirit all over the place you see Every famous coach you've ever seen on TV is there because it's the coach's convention. So go to a Final Four. Uh, but one of the things is we all get tickets, but we usually give them to donors or friends uh, because to them it's a lifetime experience. To us, it's another game. So I'm out with Stevie Donahue, who was then the coach at um, Boston College. Uh, I'm with John Gallagher, another Philly guy, a St. Joe's alum, who is the head coach at Hartford, and a few other coaches. And we're in a bar somewhere in Indianapolis, and it's when Michigan won. And we see these Michigan, like the whole street, it was like Mardi Gras. It was like the most, and they're singing the hail to the victors. And what we said is, this is why basketball is important. Like we said, there's no academic on, there's nothing that could create that school spirit like what we saw that night. Like there were thousands of Michigan people just in this one place going crazy. And they said, you know what? That's why they pay us pretty good money because we are the face of the university. And if we're good at our jobs and do a good job, uh, it rallies people like no, listen, business department, communications department, they change lives because they give people like you and me a degree that we could use the rest of our lives. But no one's going to go, you know, crazy in the streets because of something that happens in a classroom. Uh, the power of sports is incredible. So when I came home and I saw the videos of the students on the streets, and my wife was even wide-eyed. I mean, we've been married since the Illinois years. She's seen everything in sports. And she said what you guys said. You weren't here, but you won't believe it. She said the whole city was into it. So um, as a participant, you don't get to enjoy it as much because you're working. Like, it's literally work. You're still trying to figure out how to guard Wichita State. You're still trying to figure out how to score against Mississippi or how to – Stop Mitchell Ham and Henderson, the land yeah. like, you're, like, you're working. You're not like, isn't this great? Um, but it's afterwards you really realize it and, uh, and appreciate it. And all of us are on this podcast because we love sports. Like, I still haven't found anything in life that has that level of excitement. Yeah. I, and you going like this just brought me DJ Peterson yeah. running down the court. After we yeah. won that game, that was that was incredible. Yeah, doing Marshall's thing. <laughs> well, and and coach, you talked about community, and, and it's funny because not just in Philadelphia, but I'm looking at your your entire resume, right? Rowan, obviously, in the Philadelphia area, but then you go up to Maine and have so. I mean, you're still the winningest coach, and your percentage there is phenomenal. And I, I think you're the only one to have two uh, 21 plus seasons there for them, and just all the success, like. Everywhere you went, you really changed the culture. So, I mean, like, and then, <laughs> you've probably been bashful with a question like that, but it's like, what is, I mean, what does that mean to you that you could leave your footprint on all these different places well, successfully? Well, the, the Sweet 16 gives me some relevance at LaSalle, but you always wish you did better. Um, <laughs> like at Maine, we beat, uh, we beat Providence, we beat Marquette, we beat Northwestern, we beat uh, St. Louis, we beat uh, 
but, 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 but missing someone else. But we were good. And like Jay Wright was at Hofstra. Mike Bray, the Notre Dame coach, was at Delaware. And we were having success. It was those three teams were the top teams. So we were good. I made it to two championship games, but we didn't win it. So my biggest regret about Maine is not taking them to the NCAA tournament. And my biggest regret about LaSalle is that I didn't sustain our success. So again, coaches are good because it, they're always looking at what they could do better. That's what makes them good. So even after your, your tenure at a school, you, you, you're proud of what you did, but what eats at you the most is I should have done better. I should have sustained things better at LaSalle, or I should have got Maine to the, to the NCAA tournament. So, you know, it's coaching's tough because there's a lot of criticism, a lot of pressure. Not everyone, like, in some jobs, every surgeon, every broadcaster could be good. But in coaching, half of you are going to lose. And when you get to that level, like, everyone's good. Everyone has resources. So winning's hard. Um, there's a lot of pressure to do it. You're lucky to do it, but um, you're so focused on trying to win that I wouldn't say it's fun. You have a, 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 a sensation of gratitude for doing it, and it's exciting and you're motivated. But for me, I think it was too, uh, you, ha you had to be too focused on getting the results to like really enjoy it. Or have fun, yeah. Yeah. Well, but talk about the success, though, from LaSalle. Like, I actually wrote an article when I was there, um, and I titled it Transfer You. Uh -huh. um, so can can you just talk about, like, how you go about getting a, a Garland, a Galloway, Price, B.J. Johnson? Like, where do you find – like, I know that most of them are Philly guys to begin with, but how do you find the right connection where they – it didn't really work out at their old school, but they're going to come into into a non-power five and, and really do well. I was going to add, so, that's like a second layer of trust you need there. <laughs> well, well, two things. Uh, first, um, a lot of people have transfers. Mine just happened to be really good. Uh, <laughs> guys, Duran, Mills, Wright, Zach, Peterson, Brown. Of our top eight, only two were transfers. But the reason mm -hmm. people think of the transfers is because they were so good. I mean, Ramon Galloway was one of the best players in the country. Tyrone Garland made the darn floater, you know. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm proud of those guys. I don't mind uh, at all, and I'm proud of our transfers. And But I think people forget that a lot of my teams, the, the a lot of the really good players were high school kids. Now, as we went on, we, we had more transfers, and there was never a design to that. It was really who's the best player that we could get. And if it happened to be a transfer, um, so be it. But that's another topic with the transfer portal. And it looks like um, it looks like in basketball, transfers are going to be free to transfer wherever they want and play right away. So you're going to see astounding free agency in basketball, college basketball, and football coming up. And it's going to make it really hard to build a program because I think Everywhere you're going to see 25 to 50 percent of the team change every year. So it's just the games are still going to be great, but it's going to be like the pros, where it even more so maybe where it's not. When I was growing up, believe it or not, I'm old enough. There was no free agents, like the, which was good and bad. It was good mm -hmm. because to be a fan of Gail Sayers and Dick Buckus and know that they're not going to go anywhere. But if your quarterback was Bob Avellini, you know. <laughs> <laughs> who wasn't right? Yet I like that was your call. How are you going to get someone else unless you get lucky in the draft? So uh, you're going to see teams get really bad and really fast, really quick. Like in the NFL, every year someone goes from worst to first in their division. In college basketball, you're going to see a team that you think is great, and a handful of kids are going to leave, and they're not great. And then you're going to see someone who's not good pick up like two, three really good guys. It's going to be a little crazy, and the rationale is if a soccer could play, a player could play right away. Why can't the basketball player? If a biology major can transfer, you know, why can't the basketball player? But it's going to be the Wild West. It's it's. And here's an example. So I finished that 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 Charlotte versus Marshall game, and after the game, I'm talking with a parent of a really good player, 
And he says, yeah, we don't know what we're going to do next year because a lot of schools are reaching out to us. And that's totally against the rules. Like, people are going to tamper. Like, you can, until a kid enters in the transfer portal, you're not supposed to touch him. I'm not supposed to go mm -hmm. to your player and say, why don't you come to my school while he's your player? But people are doing it, which really stinks. And uh, I'm a little worried about it for the coaches and players. For the fans, it'll be great. The games will still be great. It'll kind of be like good Italian sausage. Tastes <laughs> great. You just don't want to see how they make it. <laughs> <laughs> and real quick, just jumping into the chat real quick. So we had two really good questions. So the first one off the point of recruiting, just uh, Dr. Jeannie, what was the toughest uh, challenge recruiting for LaSalle? And then I'll just add the second question from Dan Hannigan, um, who wanted to know um, just what was it, who would you say is your favorite current coach to watch right now? Oh, geez. So, um, uh, so the, and this is known with LaSalle. It, it's facilities. We have a gym on that. We have a, they say it's 4,000, it's 3,000. We basically <laughs> have a good high school gym on the third floor above a swimming pool. Now, in the end, you have a lot of really nice arenas. Uh, and now you have a lot of shocking practice facilities. Uh, VCU has a $30 million practice facility that's second to none. Um, uh, UMass has a phenomenal practice facility. Uh, Dayton does. You go on and on. So um, one person joked when we were you, uh, you were there. I'm sure Chad. We're playing Minnesota in the NIT, and the joke was that um, uh, was that Tubby Smith was going to ask, "Tell me, you really need a new practice facility? It's not very nice, but where's the game going to be tonight?" <laughs> <laughs> and then you got playing all the crappy facility is really our game facility. Uh, but like it's uh, facilities cost a lot of money. And it, it, it's, you know, St. Uh, if you look at like St. Louis, Dayton, UMass, what they've done, like they have probably a combined 100 million between their game and practice facility wrapped up in men's basketball facility. And I think Gola cost like two or 3 million back in the day. And, you know that, and then you have locker rooms, weight rooms, uh, meeting rooms, video rooms, and uh, we don't have those. You know, well, we do, but they're a lot closer to the small college level than the people you play against. But now here's the thing. We went to the Sweet 16, and St. Bonaventure, they might have a, 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 a facility that looks more like a, a, an A-10 facility, but it's old. And they don't have good locker rooms. They don't have good weight rooms. They don't have a, they have a terrible recruiting location. And they're good every year right now. So, and that's what I thought I was going to do. You know, Mark Schmidt is good enough to win at a tough job. I thought I was good enough to win at a tough job. Uh, I, I, I really believed it. Uh, and I didn't sustain it. And it's not, it's my fault. Because uh, I think you don't need the best of everything to win. Um, and there's a lot of examples of that. Coach Cheney, before they built the Leah Corps Center, Coach Cheney coached in McGonagall Hall. Yeah. I mean, not the 4,000 seat gym. And he was number one in the country with a 4,000 seat gym. He was number one in the country ahead of Texas and UCLA and uh, Ohio State and Michigan. Uh, and he had a 4,000 seat gym. Uh, so you don't need the best of everything. But that's the challenge. I thought I was up for the challenge, and I just, I just, you know, didn't do as well as I thought I would. Uh, I mean, yeah, but, but you know, it's like the Eagles in the Super Bowl. Doug Peterson's out now. In the Super Bowl was what three years ago. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, you got Charlie Manuel won the World Series. They got rid of him. I mean, Fran Dunphy is the winningest coach in Big Five history. He's not there anymore. Phil Martelli. Number yeah. one in the country, undefeated regular season, elite eight. He's not there anymore. So, really, they say there's two kinds of coaches, but I believe there's three. There's coaches who have been fired, coaches who are going to be fired, and Hall of Famers. Like, Jay Wright will never be fired. You know, like, if you are literally a Naismith Hall of Fame coach, you probably won't be fired. But if you're not, you're probably going to be at some point. 
And it's such a great point. No, I was going to say, and to that point, like, I guess how, you, and you brought up a great point earlier when we were talking about just how 50% of the people, right, in the line of work, no matter what you do, it's just yeah. win and lose. Hey, my and, dentist, that is my mechanic, uh, the professors on campus. There's no AD that's meeting at me at my door trying to block me out of my office or trying to tackle me and take my car keys from me. I'm that basketball court. People are going to try to rip that ball out of your hands. Mm try to take your head off when you drive to the basket like I, I like when people said is that the shot you wanted at the end of the game and I, I I wanted them to all move out of the way and let us score the game winner but they didn't cooperate I mean <laughs> people don't want you like people wake up every morning trying to out recruit you try to out lift you in the weight room try to out practice you and come game night try to out play you so you know and listen, you're lucky to do it, but I had to worry about, you know, all the big five coaches and Travis Ford and Anthony Grant and and LeBron's coach at Duquesne and uh, and Bob McKillop at Davidson. Like when they wake up every day, they're trying to beat me. They're going to the gym and they're training their guys to beat me, and I'm training their guy, my guys, to beat them. So, like, you, you look as a fan at game day. But, I mean, we're competing 365 days a year. That's some – they pay us good money and the stakes are high and we're lucky to do it. That means we got to bring it every day. Like, I'll bring up an Andy Reid story. Um, this is a Packers story. I went to a game at Lambeau. So, at Maine, no one wanted to play us because we're in the middle of nowhere and we had a good team. No one ever wanted to play Wisconsin Green Bay because they're up north and it's cold and, and, and same thing. They have a good team. Not so, easy to get there. Woody Wilson and I, in scheduling, would talk every year, like, we need games, should we play each other? And we became friends. We both never wanted to play each other, but we became such good friends, he said, come to Green Bay, and I'll take you to the Bears-Packers game. So it was awesome. Uh, but he was also Andy Reid's former next-door neighbor. And he <laughs> said, John, he said, 5 a.m. off-season. Like May, June, like downtown, he said he he said he was out, fight like five a.m. till eleven midnight every day of the week. Like Leonard Hamilton, the seventy-something year old coach at Florida State. So I like that fishing trip in August. You know, his assistants tell me even in the summer he just stays in the office like all night looking at tape, making calls because he loves it. So uh, yeah, people work hard to beat you in that business. Yeah, so, so, so you mentioned, yeah, so you mentioned you're now, you're at, you're back at Rowan as the AD. So how, yeah, how's that feel going back to Rowan after you had, I think it was what an 81% win percentage as their head coach and including yeah, a national it, title. Yeah, it was, uh, it's great. It's like coming full circle and it's an amazing place. It really has division one demographics because it's 19,000 students. It's a national university. It's a, Carnegie Research School now. It's got two medical schools. Uh, it's But philosophically, we kind of want to stay with our Division three roots. We don't want to pay a coach more than the president, uh, which is what happens in Division one. We don't want to, uh, you know, I mean, again, spend tens and tens of millions on facilities. And frankly, uh, almost all college athletic departments lose a lot of money unless you're at one of the big football schools. Or you're like Villanova and you just get a ton of NCAA tournament money every year. Um, but of the 357 Division One schools, uh, there's probably not more than 80 tops maybe that don't lose a lot of money. Um, so we like where we are. But it's I love the location. I work with great people. It's a great school. Um, the AD thing takes some getting used to. Um, uh, but I'm lucky to do it. And it's funny too, because I was looking about like just how much you've emphasized education and, and right with, with your program. I mean, cause how, I guess, how interesting is it, you know, being on the side, of, whether it was being a coach or an AD and having that, like, cause right. We talk, I mean, we've been talking about winning and losing for, for the majority of it and not that I'm like now becoming the guy. Cause I feel like I'm, <laughs> I'm a very competitive person, but I'm almost like, wow, you know, I'm just taken back by just how much of the detail that you did with like all your players and, and right. Like how much there's that extra layer of caring, right? Like just not just 
on the hardwood. I mean, how important was that to you? Because I read an interesting article about you. I guess it was about two or three years ago in the Philly Inquirer, and it was talking about how whether it's your your family's opening Christmas presents, you're at Thanksgiving dinner, yeah. like those players are still your family, yeah. and like that doesn't just like you know that's not just inside the lines. Like, how important was that just outside the lines, just caring for them in general? I guess. So it, it's it's not only the right thing to do; it helps you win. When your players know that you care about them, number one, you're more likely to keep them. Uh, they're more likely to play hard. They're more likely to take criticism. They're more likely to, uh, you know, just uh, feel free to be themselves and to bond with their teammates and to feel like they're in a good place. So I always felt like caring about people, A, was the right thing, but B, it helped us win. Um, so... And these relationships are forever. We have a fun football contest that uh, me and some of my former players do. And we don't gamble money, but we pick every NFL game uh, of the season. And we take the winner out for dinner after the season. And I, I could go on and on. Two days ago, there's a player that Chad, it's a player that you, oh, no, you might have graduated a year. But he just had an uh, um, uh, uh, no, un uncle die of COVID, a cousin, like, just suddenly die. And. I, I, I reached out to him, not because, you know, it's just those, it really is family. It's, it should last. And I'm not close with a hundred percent of my former players, um, but I'm close with a lot of them. And uh, I think that means a lot. It's funny. Is this guys, this is where I plug myself telling the story when I got the ball dribble through my legs. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> so I have to tell you this story. I have to at least, you know, kill myself on the air a little bit here and make, make fun of myself coach so uh, we were talking about so first of all you know we, we talked about the big five and, and just how cool it is the overlapping and, and players working out with each other and i uh, was saying i was in the practice squad at temple you know earlier on in my career and uh and i was saying i was teammates with two uh well i guess two of your uh guys at LaSalle, ramon galloway and Tariq durham which i first of all i got and i didn't tell you this story off the air i'll never forget we're on a fast break ramon galloway sucks the ball off the glass goes so fast up the floor. I'll never forget running and just hearing, move, dude, and just looking. And he, he's already airborne. Like, and just, I'm just, he almost like dunked on me as like we're on a fast break. I'm like, oh, my God. So, I mean, what was it like coaching just some of those special players? And then I'll, I'll get to the Ty Garland part after so, that. So, first of all, I think uh, Ramon Galloway, NBA Summer League, or Ramon Galloway, it's Will Cauley-Stein. He dunks mm -hmm. on Will Cauley-Stein in the Las Vegas Summer League. Unbelievable. And of course, he had spectacular dunks with us. And there's a saying that I really like that every successful coach stands on the shoulders of their players. You look at Bill Belichick. I mean, he is great. But with and without Brady, you know, Patriots versus Browns, you look at Phil Jackson with uh, Michael Jordan and Kobe, then without those guys at the Knicks, like the best coaches in history. Uh, it's all about the players. And I always, um, and it's weird, uh, the coach at Marshall just because it's, it's Dan D'Antoni, whose brother, he coached with his brother, Mike D'Antoni, uh, with the Phoenix Suns and Los Angeles Lakers. And, and as I'm talking with him last week, he says, it's, so it's always the players' team. It's never the coach's team. Don't think it's your team. It's their mm. team. And uh, he also had a funny story when he was scouting when he was an assistant for the Lakers, he saw different assistants have scouting reports. And when they told Kobe to guard this play this way or that way, if Kobe didn't like it, he would attack them. So he just learned on a scouting report. He said, well, Kobe, this is what they're going to do. How do you want to guard it? You know. And he said it worked because when you ask people, how do you want to do it? Now, they it, it's not so much that it's their input, but it's their decision. You know, it's like, hey, I want this to work because uh, this is my choice. So I, I just think respecting players um, and how important they are is everything. So, you know, one by one, like I'll give you a great Ramon Galloway story. So um, Ramon missed a couple classes and we're playing Butler, number nine in the country. And I just say, Ramon, this isn't a big deal but it can become a big deal if you keep missing classes. And I want to address this right now. So I'm not going to start you tonight. I'm listen. I was smart enough to say, not say I'm not going to play. You. I would have been out of my mind if I said that, 
Um, but so he was upset because um, he's so competitive. Uh, and we put him in after a little while in the first half. Well, anyway, he makes the game-winning basket. And, you know, just to see a guy that uh, can handle some adversity, understand that you're doing something because you actually do care about him, and just so talented and so resilient and so big in big moments. Like, I love that story about him. And just an incredible leader. Um, yeah, and I could do that about any one of the guys. And to inspire, so you know, I'll plug the, the bad story in real quick of the embarrassing. For, you know, for, for the record, Sunny Hill is a fun, fun, good league, for, for, you know, traditional league. But um, so, and it's funny you were talking about Ty Garland, that Southwest was it, was it the Southwest Philly Florida chat? Is that what you call it? Yeah, I'm gonna need to get to that in a minute. But go okay. ahead. <laughs> I'll hype you up. So before you ask your question, so we're playing that league right. Another one of the um, members of the South team. I'll never forget our coach in the summer league. I, for, I I'm trying to think who it was. It was an assistant at a D2 level, and I remember him just screaming, press, press, and I just turn around, and I'm like, as we're inbounding the ball to him, so I just step up. I'm like, I got ball, and I'll just never forget, whoop, just, just the ball right through the legs, <laughs> just the entire gym just going up like it was like a scene like Coach Carter or something like that, just going nuts, and I just remember, like, just looking, but, like, by the time I realized, like, what had happened, he already went right around me, got the ball, and was just going coast to coast, and I was just like, wow, this is, this is a story I'll tell about one day. I, you know, I never thought of you with, with you, Dr. Giannini, so it's pretty cool. <laughs> You're not alone on that. When I was talking with Brad Stevens, the coach of the Celtics, trying to get Tyrone into training camp, and I said, listen, I don't know if he's good enough to make your team, but I know he'd be unbelievable in camp because he has NBA quickness. I said, I know how good you are but I guarantee you, you don't have a player on your team faster than Tyrone Gull. So if you want a legit practice body, he'd be unbelievable. And you know what? You might find out that you really, really like him and, and you might want to keep him. But I said, the worst thing, like you'll have the fastest guy in the gym to push your players every day. So that's how fast Tyrone is in terms of, and it, he could have been a football cornerback. He could have been, I mean, he's just a stunning athlete, and as Chad knows, a riot to be around. Just a fun mm -hmm. love guy. Yeah, yeah, that's a great way to describe him. But so my biggest question, I've had it for years, um, that play. So you called timeout with, I think it was 32 seconds left in the game. Um, and, you know, it's not the NBA where you get to advance the ball, we have to bring it all the way down the court. But so, like, halfway through, just kind of dribbling out, Tyreek's dribbling out. They switch sides. So was that the play call, or did they did they change it so, on the fly on the, on the court? There's my part and then their part, and <laughs> both were important. So my part is that if you – they had the best shot blocker in the SEC, and they're playing 2-3 zone. And mm -hmm. one of my former assistants, a guy named Joe Cassidy, and I remembered it. Joe said, you might not get a layup. We actually did. He said, but – there's four perimeter players on a 2-3 zone, and the center's just in the middle. So if you don't have a post player and you go with five guards, like somebody has to be open. And as you all know, out, we're taking Rohan out. We're going to just have no post, and we're going to put the ball in Tyreek's hands, and you know he'll make the right decision. And you really can't make a mistake. Tyreek saw, he, he thought he could drive and set up Tyrone's you know, that was my idea. But Tyreek seeing Tyreek really told Tyrone, I'm going to drive here and you come behind me. Like that was all Tyreek and Tyrone and Ramon once they got out there. Gotcha. All right. That's, that's a cool little, like, yeah. tying it together. Uh, so it's like watching there. film. I'm like loving this. <laughs> yeah. I could like ask you a million questions about just the big five days. Let me ask you just for your broadcasting and stuff right now. I feel like Gonzaga is in a league of their own right now playing. Baylor's obviously been great. Just what have you been seeing just from this year and, and, and just with the tournament kind of right around the corner conference tournaments this week? What, kind of what's the vibe just looking at this March Madness field this year? Yeah, so uh, a couple things. First, um, it's full disclosure. Like in recruiting, people would ask me, what do you think of Rasheed Wallace or what do you think of Kobe Bryant? I said, I don't know. I'm not recruiting him. So – if it's not A-10 or Conference USA, I'm not watching it a lot. Uh, I did watch Gonzaga, Virginia, because I have friends on the Virginia staff as college basketball team since the early days, since the Ewing teams, since the the uh, 
the Carolina teams with Jordan and Worthy and those guys, um, since the great Duke teams, I think Gonzaga, I don't know if they're as good as those teams, but I would go so far as saying that most the best team I've seen. I mean, they're obliterating people. Like, they don't have close games. I mean, Virginia is a legitimate top 10, 15 team, and they were beating them by, like, 40. Uh, so the Gonzaga thing, I think, is amazing. So there's a story. Um, oh, I think it's Macy. Uh, it's Teague. Yeah, I think it's Macy Teague. So here's some of the stuff that drives you crazy in recruiting. So this actually, that Sweet 16 team partly got me in trouble because of how, how good they were. So there's a player that Sean Neal on our staff really liked out of Cincinnati named Macy Teague. And he could really shoot it. And I was dumb enough to call Chris Mack at Xavier. And I said, listen, do you think the kid's good enough for us? And well, first, are you recruiting him? And he says, no, we're not recruiting him. And I said, well, how good do you think he is? He goes, listen, I've known the kid since he was eight. He's gone to my basketball camps. And he said, I don't think he's as good as Galloway or Duran or Mills. or." And I'm like, okay, like that's a tough bar to read. He was in our team camp. He didn't play that well. He had 36 for Baylor the other night. Oh, my God. <laughs> like, the number of good players that I didn't take. I mean, I'm serious. I got way too picky. And uh, a lot of good players. And he's one that you're going to probably watch in the Final Four that would have come to a sell like that. And the coach at Louisville and then Xavier said, I don't think he's messed me up a little bit because I kept trying to find guys like to – and we could just never duplicate it. Zach, you got it. Yeah, no, Zach, you see no, I, I was, no, I was going to say, so is there, I mean, it's kind of similar to what you just said, that like, is there a team kind of in the weeds, whether it's from the A-10 or Conference USA, that could resemble that number 13 LaSalle? Uh, out of Conference USA, it would be Western Kentucky. They had a terrible game at Houston, but they won at Alabama, uh, who's tough. Yeah, St. Bonaventure, um, I, I think if they beat VCU, they're so disciplined and so well coached, and they have great rim uh, protection. They have a great point guard. If VCU could do it. Um, Loyola Chicago has that, like they made that Final Four run, and they might have a team that's as good defensively as anyone anywhere. Like people have a hard time scoring 60 points against them. Um, uh, trying to think of someone else uh but yeah if you could get one of those three like they'll all be under seeded they'll all be less than a 9 10 seed uh so they're going to be the underdog in whatever game that they play uh so if you want to pick an underdog though those three western kentucky st bonaventure loyola chicago not bad um uh, and if bell is belmont Belmont's always a good pick, and I think they're rolling. Like, their style of play and their shooting, Belmont is another one of those teams. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of non-Power 6 teams. Uh, nope, those are my picks. Belmont, Loyola, Chicago, Western Kentucky, and St. Bonaventure. And if I think of some more while we're talking, you know what? No, no, no. I was going to say Liberty, but I think they're really good. But I still think they lost a lot from last year. But Liberty's a team to look at that'll be in the tournament, too. I think the three of us just took some notes. So, Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, it's like I thought you were saying class where like, the professor saying, now write that one down again. Like, you know, it's like, all right. <laughs> so you said it was, yeah. <laughs> We we really like sports, but we somehow don't do the best betting. So we like to use <laughs> use our guests to help us out. <laughs> um, we do have one more one more really good question in the chat. So um, just uh, one of our um, followers, I should say, uh, said you did a great job um, when you were at LaSalle with coaches versus cancer. So do you still have any connections with that, or you have anything that you're involved with? Well, COVID really slowed them down because the gala was canceled last year. It was canceled this year. All their golf tournament, uh, the selection, Monday breakfast. So, you know, that that's all on hold. I've done some promotional videos with them. I still talk with our women's back. So I coached Demetrius Poles here. He uh, was a great – actually, he 
he was one of my first transfers. He was an A-10 all-rookie guy at St. Joe's, had a heart condition. Uh, they told him he can't play ever again, kind of like what happened to Ashley Howard. A couple years later, he gets clear means basketball coach now, and now he's battling cancer. So at a young age, you know, he's 40-ish. Um, so I'm sure all three of you guys, so, and, and Phil Martelli and Fran Dumpy were incredible leaders. They were like the top good because of the people you met. Like when you, when you met these people who are fighting cancer and you meet people who are fighting for them, and you think of the people in your life that uh, go through this, it, it's special. It, it was not a thing where we felt obligated. It was really something that we were and remain passionate about. Gotcha. Awesome. And if anyone ever wanted to take it, like, aside from money, so what uh, Phil Martelli and Fran Dumpy decided, like, research is critical because that's how you're going to cure it. But even us raising a million dollars a year, which is about what we were doing, on the research level, doesn't go that far. So what they decided to do is build a wing of Hope Lodge, uh, which is a across the, the river over there. Uh, I forget what town. I've obviously been there. But uh, it's where people could go to stay um, while they're and, and commute back and forth for their treatments and it's yeah. a beautiful place but what they ask for are volunteers to help serve dinner there every night so if anyone you could contact me or contact the hope lodge directly but uh it's just inspirational and it puts everything in perspective when you think you're having a bad day we're almost really never really not having a bad day compared to what some people are going through well, that's that's awesome. We can definitely attach that. Yeah, um, seems from uh, talking to you, Doctor Giannini, is that uh, basketball is more than just what's on the court. It goes well beyond that. So it's definitely great to hear, and one thing we can absolutely take away. Thank you. It's so I got this from Fran Dumpy, who got it from Harry Litwack, the first Hall of Famer at Temple before John Chain, and he said, "Why do I coach? Where else would I find such fine company?" So in other words, the people that you meet, and I'm. It's, it's sport in general. I'm sure all three of you that you just mentioned, you and Karen grew up, you know, back, going to sports camps together, basketball and sports talk. But someday it's about helping each other out in life and professionally and bad with the people that you have those sport relationships with for sure. Um, let me ask you if you heard this quote from, from Coach Dump before. I, I love this. He used to mention this in practice. All will give some, but only some will give all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's great. But now here's the dumb thing, which I probably should have said, but whenever he's got his mouth covered up like that, oh. <laughs> then, then it's not so positive. Uh, <laughs> I believe Wyatt told me that. We were sitting in film, and he was like, you ever see Coach do this on TV? And I was like, yeah. He's like, uh, yeah, you know. <laughs> I, I will say there was there was nothing better than being at the Gola and being able to hear, physically hear, the, the, the stuff that you would say. Say during games, well, oh, those games are awesome. Big five it games. Was, <laughs> it was, it was, oh, it was just a treat. Those were some doozies. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, Coach, thank you so much. For, I mean, we, we want to take. An, I mean, we've taken more than an hour of your night. I mean, well, I, let's, let's make it a March Madness tradition. If you guys absolutely. Would Okay. Oh yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And, you know, we might have to do some some Bears Packers chatter too in the football oh, season coming. Listen, if you want me on for Bears Packers or Bears Eagles anytime, you I'd be upset if you didn't get me on that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, well, Doctor G, you're oh my god, you're a friend of the show for us forever. We, this is so much fun. I, like, yeah. I was like looking down, I was like, oh my god, it's already after eight. <laughs> like, yeah. we really appreciate just all the time you, you made for us tonight, and and it was a blast talking. And, and I know the chat. Uh, loved you know chatting and questions. We really appreciate answering them as well. Uh, you guys are great. It's a blast. Like I said, sports connect us all, and let's stay connected. And hopefully, I talk with you guys come football season. All right. 